Hi guys, it's your science teacher here, back with another video. This time I'm going to go through the whole of the topic of B17, which is organisation in our ecosystem. So without further ado, let's get started with today's video. The topic of organization in an ecosystem starts off by looking at different feeding relationships and how different animals and plants interact with one another in an ecosystem. So down here what I have is a food web and you may have encountered these in key stage 3 and I know for sure that you will have encountered food chains in key stage 3. Um, but let's have a look at this food web and let's follow um, a few branches and see what we have here then. So down here I have uh, some grass and I think this is an African uh, savanna ecosystem. I'm just looking at some of the animals on show here but let's start off with grass and if I follow this arrow here these arrows represent an animal eating so um, and energy transfer so we've got grass and that is being eaten by a mouse and let's follow this upwards here and look at what eats the mouse this is a caracal which is an African wildcat and that is eating the mouse and let's follow this arrow from the caracal and that is being eaten by the lion and these arrows are just representing the energy moving through the ecosystem. Now, it's really important to remember that every single um, food web or food chain starts with a producer. Because of the fact that producers make their own food, they photosynthesize, they turn the sun's energy into food. They combine carbon dioxide and they combine water and they make glucose. After our producers, we have these primary consumers and these eat producers. Then we have our secondary consumers. And finally, we have our tertiary consumers. Now, if I just take a random animal from this food web and we start to look at um, the different animals that it eats and... Um, what eats it, we can start to use some terms to describe the different animals. So here I have a aardvark, um, and this is actually one of my favourite animals, it's a very strange looking creature. And aardvarks eat ants, and they also eat termites. So an aardvark can be described as a predator, because it is um, eating live food. Now, it is also a prey species, because if we follow an, at this arrow here, it is clearly being eaten by a hyena. So, an aardvark can be described as a predator, species, predator and as a prey species as well. There's only a few species that do not get eaten by anything else, and we can describe these as our apex predators. just like our lion here and the vulture. When we start to look at a food web, we can also start to think about the impact that it would have removing some of these species from an ecosystem. For example, let's take our lovely meerkat here. Now, meerkats, they prey on grasshoppers. So if we removed grasshoppers from our ecosystem, then we wouldn't have as many meerkats. And if we look as well and follow this arrow here, meerkats also get eaten by hyenas, and the hyena population would also be affected just by removing one little cog from our ecosystem. This is why we call the animals that are in an ecosystem, we call them a community, because they're interdependent on one another. And if we take out a few species, this can have a massive effect on other species as well. If we just take a few species, um, though, and we uh, identify what's called a predator-prey relationship, we see this trend that's shown in the graph. In this particular graph, 
our Canadian lynx is the predator and the hare is the prey species. Now some key things from this graph. You'll always notice that there is less predators than prey. And this is because of the fact that energy, as it moves through an ecosystem, it starts to pass on less energy. And I'll cover this when I go over the next topic. We'll look at something called the pyramid of biomass. As well as this, you can also see that as the prey, as the hair species increases, the predators starts to increase as well. So let's just have a look at a bit of the graph where it shows this. Here in 1860, just after, um, there is a massive spike in the number of hair uh, running around. And shortly after, with a bit of a lag, uh, the number of lynx species starts to increase as well. Now there's always going to be a bit of a lag. That means there's always going to be a bit of time where it takes the predators uh, a bit of time to adjust to the fact that there's more prey species now and they can start reproducing more as there's more food available. But then if we look here at about 1865, the number of hair drops rapidly. This could be due to any abiotic or biotic factors. We've looked at them in other videos, um, but um, it causes the numbers to go down. And you'll notice the same thing happens with the lynx numbers as well. Shortly followed by the prey species going so low, the predator species also drops as well. Now, there was a key element of the food web that is missed out, um, which is how the nutrients um, return back to the soil after animals die and during their lifetime as well. Animals produce something called feces, uh, which is all the waste uh, that they produce during their lifetime and this goes into the ground and we also have things called decomposers which help return uh, all the nutrients that animals make over their lifetime back into the ground because if you think about it when all of these animals are eating these producers um, we need to be able to return all of them nutrients back to the soil and back into the producers and this is the role of the decomposer. Now you might be thinking what is a decomposer? Well usually a decomposer is either some type of fungi, bacteria or insect or worm. And their key jobs, like I said, is return the nutrients to the soil. All the things like carbon, nitrogen, all of the important things that plants need as well, um, they return back to the soil. Here we can see an apple which is being broken down uh, through decomposition. And um, that is an example of these decomposers returning the nutrients back into the ground but like i said it doesn't have to be a plant dying it could be uh, dead animals it could be um, as well feces and it can also be them dead plants like this apple here which is uh, trying to spread its seeds um, in order for the plant to reproduce now, I said that carbon was one of the key uh, nutrients that gets recycled by decomposers, um, but actually, how does this carbon cycle work? Well, uh, we have uh, carbon, which is produced by these plants when it, when it produces that glucose, doesn't it? it? It takes in CO2, it turns it into glucose, and that carbon is then either eaten by animals and they store that carbon and then when they die it's returned to the soil um, and then it could be taken in by another plant or it could form fossil fuels underneath the ground uh, which is a store of carbon isn't it like coal and oil now unfortunately we are returning a lot of this carbon back into our atmosphere and this is disrupting our carbon cycle massively because of the fact that fossil fuels are not being made in the same rate of us burning them. And this is causing lots of carbon dioxide to build up in our atmosphere. 
Now there's other forms that carbon dioxide gets into the atmosphere. I know there's respiration of animals, um, which also puts into carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. And we've got to remember that plants do take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, but they cannot take it out at a rate quick enough uh, in order to slow down this uh, climate change that we're causing due to the disruption of our carbon cycle. Now, as well as um, carbon being stored in fossil fuels, carbon can also get trapped up in the ocean and it can also be stored in some rocks like limestone. Now, we're just going to look at one more cycle to finish off this topic, and that is the water cycle. Now, water is put into our atmosphere by evaporation from uh, lakes and rivers and the ocean and also transpiration which is evaporation from plants. This evaporation and transpiration forms clouds and these clouds when they start to um, go over land we get precipitation and this is just the same as rainfall and then they can it can either get returned back into rivers and go into uh, the sea and evaporation and transpiration keep happening again or sometimes this thing here infiltration occurs where it starts to get stored underwater this is actually how we get a lot of our clean drinking water is groundwater stores and then we obviously filter that water and we um we clean it in order to make it safe to drink now I hope you've enjoyed this video, remember if you did drop it a like and please subscribe to the channel.